Let's begin our look at the throne speech from last week. Of course, Justin Trudeau wrote the throne speech delivered by the Governor General. Joining us in studio now, St. Catherine's MP, Chris Biddle. Chris, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. And of course, Chris, as a sitting MP for the sitting government, you must have a lot to say about the throne speech. Let's talk, first of all, about some of the supports for people who are working, not working, people who are ill, and all of those things, some new measures in that throne speech promise. A absolutely, and I think the, the main takeaway from the first, first part of the throne speech is that the government of Canada has, has your back to those who are listening, and it doesn't matter where you are, business, individuals, we are going to be there for you as we have been. Um, compared to our G7 allies, we are in strong financial shape, um, and so we have, um, I know the former finance minister used to like to call it fiscal firepower to use to help Canadians. And so one of the, one of the items as we move away from the uh, Canadian emergency response benefit that helps so many into an EI based system, um, there's going to be supports, but it's also going to include people who didn't typically have access to employment insurance like uh, self-employed uh, people. Uh, like those in the gig economy, because the, as we all know, the economy's changed, but EI supports haven't. We look at this Bill C-2 that extends the financial support, and it really seems to set a minimum of $500 a week, which is very similar to the CERB with the $2,000 a month. How did that value be, end up being targeted? Well, that's, um, it, it seemed to be negotiations uh, through the parties. We are a minority government, so we can't, we can't just impose what, what we want. And so we had those discussions, and the CERB has been uh, very helpful. It's, it's being moved over to a more traditional system through EI, which I think will make it a little bit... Um, uh, a little bit better to keep track of and ensure that the right people are getting the getting the funds that are needed. Um, and so we saw a great deal of success with with CERB and hopefully we see that that continued success going forward because if we don't act as a government, we're going to see people lose their houses, lose their apartments, not being able to afford uh, to put food on their table. And if we dig a recession so deep, it's going to be extremely challenging to get out of it. And so government needs to be there to uh, help ease the blow that uh, COVID-19 has provided and get us through to the other side. And it'll be a lot, it'll be painful, but it'll be a lot less painful than if government did nothing. When we look at all of this money that is being pumped into the economy, the question that keeps being asked, where does all this money come from and what will this do to the national debt? Well, when Canada faces a crisis, we, um, the Canadian government has the uh, ability to borrow, and we did that. Um, this is the greatest crisis we faced during the Second World War, and sometimes I, a little flippantly, will tell people we didn't, we didn't surrender during World War II because um, it was too much debt to take on. And so we're facing an economic challenge that is the greatest that we've faced. And we're going to take on debt as the federal government because it's much easier for the federal government to take on debt than for Canadians to take on debt in their credit cards, in their mortgages, um, and uh, with uh, various loans. And so that's the best path forward. We have the capacity to do that. Um, it's only Canada and Germany have the highest credit rating that uh, credit rating agencies give out. And so we're in good financial shape. The economists are telling us to spend money to make sure that there's money in the economy. We have to do it in a fiscally prudent way. This isn't, these aren't programs that are going to be there forever, um, but we, we have to ensure that Canadians are taken care of. Chris, heading into this throne speech, there was a lot of talk that there, there could be a shove into an election if what was being put out there wasn't palatable to the, to the other parties. Was there a thought when Trudeau was putting this together that he had to win over the support of one of those parties, perhaps the NDP in this one? Well, I think whatever we do, whether it's legislation or budgetary measures, we're, all, we're going to have to win the support of at least one party. Um, it will take all three parties to band together to um, defeat us in a vote of confidence, but um, I think the last thing Canadians want at the moment is an election. It's not, it's not responsible, um, and so they want us to roll up our sleeves and work together 
and we'll find partners as they're needed. In the past, it has been uh, with the Bloc. This time, it seems to be with the NDP. I'm sure going forward, there may be times that um, it will be the Conservatives that we align our interests with, and that's what Canadians want. And they, um, they see how well the Prime Minister has worked with Premiers and how well the Premiers have worked with the Prime Minister. It's not a one-way street, but those are Premiers who represent Conservative, NDP, and Liberal, uh, liberal governments. And when we're facing a crisis such as this, that's what Canadians want, not bickering and uh, seeing a politician at the door when they should be going up to Ottawa and getting work done for them. Really quickly, a national child care program and also pharmacare, those were two things that were mentioned in that throne speech. Do you think we'll see them? Because we've heard these promises before. Do you think that we, that we will see them before the end of this political term? Um, it'll be interesting to see because there, there are two areas that are uh, traditionally areas of provincial jurisdiction. And so on pharmacare, um, we have taken um, many of the steps forward that we need to. So we created a national drug agency so that we're buying drugs in bulk as a country rather than 14 separate uh, governments, provinces, territories, and the federal government. Um, we've released a formulary to determine the pricing of, of drugs. And we've also made a big commitment, which would be the biggest stumbling block to Pharmacare, which is that the federal government will step up and cover rare conditions, which are, when we see it in the news, the, those big cost pharmaceuticals are often for those types of conditions. And so the federal government stepping up and saying, we'll take care of that deals with one of the big stumbling blocks. But Canada remains the only um, country that has universal health care, but doesn't have universal Pharmacare. And I saw that when I was chair of Quest Community Health Center, so many individuals in our communities who have to make a choice. Do I get prescription drugs or do I put food on my table? Do I pay for the rent? And if you're making that decision, it's going to lead to a cost. What's the cost of not providing that person the drugs they need? They'll end up in, um, end up in the hospital and that's a more expensive option. And in terms of childcare, we've seen um, the erosion of women in the workforce to a point that we've lost 30 years of progress in this last six months. And so childcare is a big stumbling block. And I look at it from the other side, if we don't recover from that gap and we don't deal with issues like pharmacare, what are the social, societal, and economic costs of not doing that? And I don't think we talk about that enough. Thank you for joining us today, Chris. My pleasure, thank you.